Hello and welcome to Critical Hit Wargaming. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to play Star Wars Legion, the tabletop war game set in the Star Wars universe. If you're new to the game or simply need a refresher, then this is the video for you. The likelihood is that if you're watching this, you're interested in how the game plays and probably own a few models of your own. As with almost all war games, Star Wars Legion has a starter set available that provides players with everything they need to get into the game. Two starter sets are available for Legion, one set set in the Galactic Civil War era containing Imperial and Rebel Alliance miniatures, and the other set during the Clone Wars containing Separatist Alliance and Grand Army of the Republic miniatures. The sets both contain exactly the same game, but give you different starting armies to use. You are not at any advantage or disadvantage picking one over the other, and the forces contained within are largely the same in terms of value, so pick which era is your favourite. Inside the box you'll get a commander, two core trooper units, and a support unit for each faction. In addition, you'll get the cards and tokens for each faction, as well as all the dice and game related tokens and measuring tools that you'll need to play. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, you'll receive a quick start guide that explains how to put your models together and how to play the game in simple terms. Towards the end of the booklet are some more advanced rules that are required to play the full version of the game and some tips on painting models and how to expand your collection. Despite being simple to play, the way the rules are written can make it fairly confusing to follow. In order to simplify the process of learning how to play the game properly, you can watch this video instead where we'll learn how to build an army, set up a game and play through each of the actions available to your units. I promise you that by the end you'll be more than ready for your first practice game. One of the first things you need to understand in order to play the game properly is the information contained on unit cards. Each unit in an army has one of these cards and all the rules you need to use that unit are contained on it. At the top of the card is the name of the unit and in the top left is the faction it belongs to. In this case we have Darth Vader who of course belongs to the Galactic Empire faction. To the right of Vader's name is his unit type denoted by the commander symbol. Directly below it is how many models are included in the unit before any upgrades are added. In this case, of course, it's one. By looking at the symbol on the card and the faction icon, we can work out which order token belongs to Vader. They'll need to stay together for now. Down in the center of the card is all the special rules that Darth Vader has. Most of these rules are explained in italics next to the rule, but others can be found on the back of the card, in the rulebook, or can be found in the full rulebook online. On the left hand side of the card is a series of symbols that denote which upgrade cards Darth Vader can equip. Upgrade cards are slightly smaller cards that come in the starter set and each unit box. On the right hand side of the card is either a red or white square, which denotes which colour six sided die you roll for defence in this case red. Next is how much health each model in the unit has, in this case a whopping 8 for Darth Vader. Most trooper units have a health value of 1. Below that is the unit's courage value in yellow. Ordinarily this is a number with most trooper units having a courage of 1. Darth Vader has a dash which means he has infinite bravery, he fears nothing. At the bottom of the card you can find information on a unit's weapons. The left hand symbol shows the weapon's range, in this case it's a red and white symbol meaning it's a melee weapon and can only be used in base to base contact with an enemy unit. Next to the range is how many and which colour attack dice you get to roll when attacking with that weapon. Below the weapon information is any special rules relating to that weapon, in this case impact 3 and pierce 3. Lastly, at the bottom right of the card is the measuring tool that this unit uses to move, denoted by the 1 to 3 red lines. Darth Vader has a move of 1, which is the shortest of the tools. Movement 2 is the medium length tool, and movement 3 of course the longest. When it comes to upgrading units, simply look at the back of the small upgrade cards and find the symbols that match the upgrade icons on the unit card you're using. Pick which ones you like the look of and keep them with the unit card. You'll need to reference them during a game to remember what they actually do. 
The very last thing on the card we've not mentioned till now is the points value of the unit, which is listed below the faction icon. These points values are updated online, so the cards seldom reflect the true unit cost, and as such should be largely ignored. Now we've seen how it all works and how unit cards are used, let's build a unit of stormtroopers. We know from their card that there are four models in the unit before any upgrades are added. To build my unit, I simply find a unit leader model for my collection and add three more stormtroopers. Next, I check which upgrade symbols I have and see what in my pile of cards I can use. I have one heavy weapon upgrade slot, one personnel slot, one equipment slot and one grenade slot. In this case, I decide to add a DLT-19 Stormtrooper as my heavy weapon specialist. This trooper's new weapon information is shown on the upgrade card, and I add the model to the unit. Next, I add another Stormtrooper in the unit's personnel slot, giving them a total of six squad members. Lastly, I need to find the unit's order token, so I check their faction symbol and the unit type icon on their card, and in this case, they're a core unit, denoted by a small triangle. Putting all of this together, my unit of stormtroopers is now ready for battle. To build an army, you simply repeat this process with a few units. For your first game, pick a commander, a couple of core units, and one other unit to keep it simple. At first, you can add up the points on all the cards up to an agreed total with your opponent. Alternatively, you can use an army building app such as tabletopadmiral.com to build your army list. This has the added benefit of ensuring that you're using the latest points values for all your units and upgrade cards. The next thing we need to do is build a command deck for our army. A command deck is made up of seven cards that allow players to determine who goes first in a turn and how many units are going to be issued orders. Each card has a number of white pips in the top left of the card, and ordinarily players would choose two one pip cards, two two pip cards, and two three pip cards. For your first couple of games, you should use the standard cards Ambush, Push, and Assault. Standing Orders is a card that must always be included, even in full size games. This will allow you to get used to the mechanics of the game before introducing additional layers of complexity. To determine who goes first in a turn, both players select a card from their hand and place it face down on the edge of the battlefield. You then reveal them simultaneously, and whoever has the lower number of pips is the player that goes first that turn. In the event of a draw, you simply roll a defence die. If the result is a block, the player rolling the die goes first, or if it's a blank, their opponent goes first. Other command cards are included in the starter set and in individual unit boxes that can only be used by certain commanders with abilities that greatly enhance either themselves or the units around them, such as Darth Vader's cards here. Once you are used to the rules of the game, you can add these into your command decks, where they'll eventually look like this, full game ready deck. As a general rule, commanders will have a one pip card that is particularly powerful that is designed to be used at a crucial moment in the game. Star Wars Legion uses five different types of dice. The eight-sided white, black and red dice are attack dice, whilst the red and white six-sided dice are defense dice. The attack dice can show a blank result, a hit result, a critical hit result, or a surge result. The defense dice can show a blank result, a block result, or a defensive surge. In both cases, the red dice have the highest likelihood of success, the black a 50% chance, and the white the least chance. Some cards will have an additional section that shows what surge results mean for that unit. In the case of Stormtroopers, an attack surge will be changed to a hit result when they attack. For Rebel Troopers, any defensive surges rolled will be changed to block results. With armies and command decks now successfully built, it's time to choose a mission. To choose a mission, deployment type and battlefield conditions in Star Wars Legion is a pretty cool process. Firstly, lay out three blue mission cards in a row, followed by three red deployment cards and then three green conditions cards. The player whose army has the lowest total points value is the blue player, with the other being the red player. 
Starting with the blue player, each player gets two chances to veto the leftmost card in any of the columns alternating between players. Players may choose to pass instead. In this case, the blue player decides to veto the first mission. The red player decides to pass, as they're happy with the current options. The blue player decides to veto the deployment type. The red player vetoes the mission, and with both players using their two chances, the mission, deployment and battlefield conditions are now set. For the first game, I recommend you don't worry about this step and just focus on seeing who can destroy the most units from their opponent's team. In order to best demonstrate the rules, we'll be playing through a single turn with two small forces and expanding on the rules. On the Imperial side, Darth Vader leads a unit of five stormtroopers with a DLT-19, a unit of four stormtroopers and two speeder bikes. On the Rebel side, Luke Skywalker leads two units of five Rebels, each equipped with a rotary cannon trooper. A game consists of six turns, with each player getting to use all of the units in their army in each. Each turn consists of a command step, where players choose command cards and issue orders, an activation step where players alternate selecting units to carry out two actions each, and then an end step where the game tokens are removed and tidied up ready for the next turn. For terrain in your first few games, you can just use the barricades that come in the box, but as you start getting better, you can add in more things like buildings and trees and ruins. To start the game, both players select a command card from their command deck and reveal them simultaneously. In this case, the Imperial player played a 1-pip card and the Rebel player a 2-pip card, so the Imperial player goes first. With the cards chosen, it's time for both players to resolve the effects of their cards and issue orders. The Ambush card played by the Imperial player allows an order to be issued to one unit. To issue an order, nominate which commander will be issuing the order. In this case, it's Darth Vader. He can issue an order to any unit at range 1 to 3, measured using the Range Measurement tool. Each section of the tool is range 1, and they can be combined to increase the range. Darth Vader is well within range of all the units in his force, and he issues an order to the Stormtroopers. The Imperial player searches through their pile of tokens, finds the right one, and places it face up next to the Stormtroopers. All the other tokens are shuffled and placed to one side in the Imperial order pool. The Rebel player has played the push card, allowing two units to receive orders. Luke is well within range of all of his units, and he chooses both of his Rebel Trooper squads to receive an order token. His own token is then placed in the order pool at the side of the table. As the Imperial player played the card with the lowest number of pips, they get to go first. They can choose to randomly select a token from their order pool, or they can select the Stormtrooper unit with a face-up token. Later on in the game, it could be crucial to activate a particular unit, making the use of the right command card at the right time extremely important. By randomly selecting from the order pool, you could end up drawing a token for a unit you absolutely didn't need. In this case, the Imperial player has chosen to activate the Stormtroopers. When a unit activates, it can carry out one of six different actions, but it can only do each one of them once with the exception of move actions. Units can move, dodge, aim, standby, attack, or recover. The Stormtroopers have elected to move. Move actions are carried out by placing the relevant movement tool in front of the unit leader's base and simply moving them along it. Place the base of the model in the groove at the other end and remove the measuring tool. At this point, you simply move all of the other models freely so they end up near their unit leader. Models must be able to fit inside a Move 1 measuring tool from the unit leader's base, and this is known as being in cohesion. The Imperial player chooses to move the Stormtroopers again for their second action. As they're now climbing over a low obstacle, this is classed as difficult terrain. When models cross difficult terrain, they must drop to the next lowest measuring tool. In this case, they go from a speed 2 measuring tool to a speed 1 tool. The unit leader makes a move, but chooses not to move the full distance available, stopping just the other side of the barricade. All the other models are moved into cohesion as normal. 
As the unit has used up both of its actions, it flips its order token face down so all players know that the unit has activated for this turn. Let's briefly look at some of the other things you may encounter when it comes to moving. As we just saw, you can reduce a unit's speed by 1 to a minimum of 1 to cross over barricades, low walls and difficult terrain. You also have the option of using their regular speed move and simply going round the obstacle, moving other models in the unit into cohesion as normal. Sometimes things such as buildings or high walls may be in the way. In this example, although the trooper on the right is within a speed 1 measuring tool of the unit leader, there's a wall in the way that the trooper cannot cross. In this instance, the trooper is only in cohesion at a point that he could make a speed 1 move to the unit leader. Another thing your troops may need to do is climb up obstacles to reach elevated positions. Units can climb up obstacles that are height 1 or lower measured with the range measuring tool. To climb a piece of terrain, a unit leader must start its activation in base contacts with whatever it wishes to climb. It may then spend both its actions to safely climb the obstacle, making a speed 1 move at the top. The rest of the models in the unit are moved as normal. Alternatively, units may need to still act at the top of the obstacle. In this case, they can opt to clamber up the terrain instead, which only uses one action. This is dangerous business and can prove to be fatal. Once the unit leader is moved to the top of the terrain you wish to climb, roll a white defence dice for each model in the unit. On a block result, the unit suffers one wound. Returning to our game, it's now the Rebel player's turn to select a unit. They can either draw randomly from their order pool, or select a unit with a face-up token, the same as the Imperial player. With only three tokens and two of them already on the table, it's not hard to guess what the last one will be. The player selects a unit of Rebel Troopers out in the open. As Rebel Troopers aren't very highly armoured, the player chooses a dodge action and places a green dodge token next to the unit. This represents the unit being ordered to keep as low as possible or identify cover they can easily dive into should they come under fire. For their second action, the Rebel Troopers are going to fire at the squad of Stormtroopers across from them. Range and line of sight are measured from the unit leader. In this case, if an imaginary line was drawn from the unit leader to each model in the Stormtrooper squad, over half of the Stormtroopers are obscured by the barricade in front of them. This means that they have cover in this case, heavy cover. In order to attack, a unit must declare the target of its attacks. Units can divide shots between the multiple targets, but they must be resolved one at a time. The first step is forming the attack pool. In this case, all the rebel troopers will be firing at one target, so all the dice for all their weapons is added to the attack pool. It's worth noting at this point that weapons that have any special rules will affect all the dice in the attack pool, not just the dice for that weapon. This keeps the game fluid and simple. In this case, the Rebel player has four troopers with A280 blaster rifles firing a single black die each and a Z6 rotary cannon that fires six white dice. There are no special rules for any of the weapons. The dice are rolled and the results are checked. In this case, the player has rolled three hits, a critical hit, and two surge results. The player double checks that hit surges aren't converted to anything for this unit, and then discards all the misses. If the rebel troopers had a surge token to spend, they could spend one of these tokens to turn one hit surge or one defensive surge into a hit or block. In this case, they don't, so the surge results are counted as misses. We now enter the apply, dodge and cover step of the attack process. Because the Stormtrooper squad is obscured by heavy cover, two regular hits are removed. For light cover, you'd remove one regular hit instead. Critical hits can never be removed by cover and reflect an exceptional shot made by the firer. As the Stormtroopers have been fired at and successful hits have been scored, the squad gains a suppression token. We'll explain in more detail shortly how suppression affects the unit, but for now they have gained a token and now need to roll their defence dice. Gather a number of defence dice equal to the number of successful hits, in this case two. Stormtroopers roll red defence dice, giving them a fair chance of success. Even so, they fail two rolls, and with only one health each, that means two Stormtroopers are killed. 
Having completed their activation, the Rebel Troopers flip their order token face down. Looking at shooting in slightly more detail, you may find that in some instances a whole unit is hidden except for one model. In this case, when attacking that unit, only models that are visible could be killed no matter how much damage is inflicted on the unit. In this case, the Rebel Troopers failed two saves and took two damage, but as only one model was visible, only he can be killed. In this case, he was really, really killed, and the unit gains a suppression token as normal. As a unit gains suppression tokens from enemy fire or from other means, the stress of battle will start to have an effect. As soon as a unit gains suppression tokens equal to its courage value, it is suppressed and loses one of its two actions it can carry out. It can never be reduced below one action, no matter how many suppression tokens it has. A unit that has any suppression tokens improves its cover rating by one, as the troops are filled with adrenaline running through enemy fire and are far more likely to get their heads down. A unit out in the open will receive light cover and remove one hit result if they have any suppression tokens, two hits if they are in light cover, but will still only remove two hits if they are in heavy cover. You can never remove more than two hits with cover. Thankfully, it is possible to get rid of suppression tokens. When a unit activates, it immediately attempts to rally. The controlling player rolls a number of white defense dice equal to the number of suppression tokens that a unit has. You can remove a suppression token for every block or surge result you get. If you get unlucky and roll blanks, then the suppression tokens unfortunately remain. If a unit activates and finds that even after its rally step it still has a number of surge tokens that are equal to or greater than double its courage value, the unit is panicked and receives a panic token, and may only make a move action at maximum speed towards the nearest table edge. If any part of a unit leader's base leaves the table, the unit has fled and is removed from play. A panicked unit that activates still carries out its rally step and so still may be able to remove enough suppression tokens to fall under double its courage value. At this point it may stop fleeing towards a table edge and choose a single action as normal. It's not actually that easy to panic a unit. If a unit is within range 1-3 to three of a commander unit, it may use the commander's courage value to determine whether or not they are panicked. As Darth Vader has infinite bravery, units within range 1-3 to three of him can never actually be panicked and flee. Far better to face rebel guns than Darth Vader's disappointment. Units that are heavily suppressed and at risk of panicking may choose to make a recover action one of the six available actions we previously mentioned. When a unit recovers, it removes any number of suppression tokens, readies any cards and abilities, and gets ready to get back in the fight. Returning back to our game, the Imperial player is next to go. They must randomly select an order token from the Imperial order pool and flip it over, in this case getting a commander token. As there is only one commander on the table, this will be given to Darth Vader. Darth Vader moves forward at speed 1, reflecting his sinister march across the battlefield. Next he measures the range to the rebel squad in the open and uses one of the upgrade cards he has, Saber Throw. This allows him to make a ranged attack with his lightsaber, hurling it at the rebels using the force. The attack scores a hit and a critical hit, and as the rebels have no cover and no suppression tokens, no hits are negated. During the apply dodge and cover step, the rebels spend their dodge token to negate one of the hits. Dodge tokens cannot be spent to negate critical hits. The rebel troopers have a rule called nimble on their card that means when they spend a dodge token, they gain a dodge token as they're lightly armoured troops that dart from cover to cover. They can't spend the new dodge token when resolving these attacks, however. The rebels roll a single white defence die and unfortunately fail, resulting in one trooper being killed. As it was a ranged attack, the unit gains a suppression token. Some units have equipment or upgrades that contain free actions, denoted by this symbol. A unit can perform any number of free actions, but it can only perform each one of them once. Force powers are the most common free actions you'll find in the game, and they can be used at any point during a unit's activation. In this case, Darth Vader is using force reflexes to give himself a dodge token. Some upgrade cards will have an arrow on the right hand side of the card. 
This means that although the action is free, the card is exhausted once used and is turned on its side to show that it has been spent. In order to use the cards again, the unit must perform a recover action, which allows them to reset all exhausted cards. More powerful Sith than Jedi will have an ability called Master of the Force with a number at the end. This means they can recover Force powers at the end of the turn for free, but no more than their Master of the Force rule states. As Darth Vader is now finished activating, he turns his token face down. Next, the Rebel player decides to take the last token from the Rebel Order pool, knowing it will be Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker has an ability on his card called Jump 1, which allows him to make a move action that ignores all terrain height 1 or lower. He can use this to jump onto ledges, buildings, or at this point in the game over barricades in front of him. He makes a full speed 2 move which gets him extremely close to the stormtroopers, but not quite in base to base contact. The Rebel player decides to use both of Luke's force powers, selecting Jedi Mind Trick to give the Stormtroopers two suppression tokens, and Force Reflexes to give him a dodge token. He spends Luke's second action moving in to engage the Stormtroopers. When a unit moves into base-to-base -base contact with another unit, it is considered to be engaged. The player who has been engaged may move all of their remaining models into base-to-base -base contact with the unit initiating the engagement. Ordinarily, this would be Luke having used both of his activations and his turn would end here, but as he has an ability called Charge on his card, he can make a free attack action after a move action if he is engaged with a unit. He then carries out his free attack action, forming his attack pool of 6 black dice. He scores two critical hits, a regular hit, and a surge, which is converted to a crit as stated on his card. Cover does not apply to engaged units, and units that are engaged can't be shot at. The Stormtroopers roll four red defense dice and make three successful saves. Ordinarily, this would result in one Stormtrooper being killed. However, Luke's lightsaber has the rule Pierce 2. Pierce 2 means that two successful save rolls are negated, unfortunately meaning two more Stormtroopers are killed for a total of three dead. Jedi and Sith are extremely potent units when they can get in close. As that's Luke's activation now finished, his order token is turned face down. It's worth noting at this point that a unit that activates after having been engaged by an enemy unit doesn't have to stand there and fight to the death. It can elect to withdraw from the engagement, but to do so it spends both of its actions to make a speed one move away from its attacker. Vehicles can be attacked in base to base contact but cannot be engaged and are free to move off as normal. Back to the game, the Imperial player selects a random token from their order pool. In this case it's a support token, so the speeder bikes will be activating. As they have the keyword speeder 1, they must make a free compulsory full speed move either at the beginning or end of their activation to reflect the fact that they are extremely quick vehicles. The speeder bikes elect to make their compulsory move at the beginning of their activation and fly between the barricades measured from the unit leader. The other model in the unit is moved up to the unit leader and must face exactly the same direction. As speeder movement can result in a lot of confusing scenarios when you play your first few games, let's take a look at it more closely. As this speeder bike has speed of 1, it means it must make a compulsory move, but can do so ignoring all terrain at height 1 or lower. If there is a lot of terrain in the way when you're measuring, you can hold the token over the top of the model and then move it as normal. Sometimes you may find that a model will overlap terrain it would usually ignore at the end of its move. If the terrain has a flat surface you can balance the model on top and it's perfectly legal move. In this case a barricade is not stable terrain and so you're allowed to move the speeder backwards no more than half the length of its base in order to put it in a stable position. This move is still considered as having made a compulsory move. Other times, however, you may end up in a situation where no matter which way you go, there is terrain preventing you putting your model down or moving it back half a base length. In this case, your speeder bike rider has made a serious error of judgement and has a high speed end or tree crash. 
If a speeder cannot complete its compulsory move in any direction, move it as far as you can along the path of the movement tool and inflict a number of wounds equal to the model's maximum speed. In this case, with only 3 health, the speeder bike has ploughed into a barricade and exploded. Other more durable vehicles such as this clone Bark Speeder will have more health and a durability rating listed below it in orange. When the vehicle takes a number of wounds equal to or exceeding this value, you must roll a red defense die and consult the rulebook to see what negative effect this has on your vehicle. It may be that it loses a weapon, is harder to move, or cannot move at all. Place the corresponding vehicle damage token next to the vehicle. Thankfully, speeders always make their compulsory move. Sometimes a speeder will make a compulsory move that lands on top of a unit, either friendly or enemy. In this case, the unit is displaced by a speeder or other vehicle coming hurtling at them. Move the necessary models out of the way, then make the move with your vehicle. Once the vehicle has moved, the unit that was displaced can move models back into cohesion and then it is given a suppression token. Other vehicles, in this case a ground vehicle ATRT, move in a similar fashion. They don't have compulsory moves, but may pivot on the spot for free before making any actions. When moving through units, they act in the same way, except all models on the path of the walker will have to dive out of the way too. In this case, it is marched right through both units. Back to our game. The speeder bikes decide they're going to shoot at a target. Support units with notched bases have lines scored on the top that denotes the unit's firing arcs. When you paint your models, it's important to leave these showing through to make the game a lot easier. The firing arcs extend out as invisible lines from the base and show you what enemy units fall into the front arc. To show you what I mean, I've laid these range rulers out to show what the speeder bikes can actually engage with in the forward firing arc. Luke Skywalker to the right is outside the firing arc, and so can't be fired at. He actually can't be fired at anyway as he's engaged with a unit. The rebel troopers straight ahead and to the left can both be fired at. The speeder bikes decide to aim as their first action and then attack as their second. They form their dice pool and roll their attacks. As the unit has an aim token, it can spend the token to re-roll up to two dice. They do so and score one extra hit. Upon checking the unit's card, it turns out they convert attack surges to hits, so the white die is changed to a hit for a total of four. The group of rebels out in the open has a suppression token which negates one hit as the rebels already have their heads down. They roll their defense dice and score a surge result. For rebel troopers, this is converted to a block, cancelling another of the hits. Two hits go through, and with no dodge token, two rebels are killed. The rebels get another suppression token. With the speeder bikes having finished their activation, they flip their token face down. The Imperial player has now activated all of their units, and the rebel player may activate all their own remaining units one after another. In this case, there is only one unit left to go, the rebel troops behind the barricade. They decide to split their fire between Darth Vader and the speeder bikes. They decide to target the speeder bikes hurtling towards them with the Z6 rotary cannon and at Darth Vader with their A280 blaster rifles. They make their first action and aim action to give themselves a better chance of hitting, but only one attack pool can spend the token. They roll their attacks with the rotary cannon and roll one hit. As speeder bikes have a rule called cover one, they instantly negate the single hit and so the rebel player decides to spend an aim token to re-roll two of the white dice. Unfortunately, they score no more hits, and the single hit is negated by cover. Four blaster rifles are fired at Darth Vader, scoring two hits and a crit. As Darth Vader is obscured behind heavy cover, the two regular hits are negated. The rebel troops do not count the barricade they're hiding behind as obscuring their view, as their leader is in base contact with it. Vader has a dodge token, but can't spend it to negate the critical hit, and so he's left with his defense roll alone. In this case, he rolls a blank and takes a wound. He's been hit. At this point, every unit has activated. It's technically the end of the turn, but there's one action you've not yet seen, the standby action. In this example, a strike team of rebel commandos has taken position in a building. They used their first action clambering up and with no available targets for their sniper rifle, have decided to stand by and receive a token to represent this. 
A unit cannot choose to stand by if it is already attacked during a turn. Once they're standing by, any time an enemy unit finishes a move or attacks within range 1 to 2 of it, the unit can either move or fire their weapons at that target. Once they act in this way, the token is spent and their order token is flipped face down. Sniper teams and emplacement weapons can utilise standby actions to great effect, especially if enemy units are out of range initially. Note that repulsor vehicles cannot stand by, but ground vehicles can. If a unit that is standing by receives a suppression token for any reason, their element of surprise is lost and their standby token is removed. Back to our game, we have finally reached the end step. Every unit has activated, and now it's time to clean up the battlefield and get ready for the next turn. During the end step, all green tokens are removed from the table, and each unit loses one suppression token. All the order tokens are collected and placed back in their respective pools, ready for the next turn. The turn counter is changed to number 2 and the counter is moved to the red player who will roll to break any ties for who goes first in the next turn. And with that, the first turn is complete and so is your knowledge of how to play most of the mechanics in the game. With everything that you've learned here, you should have no trouble building an army, setting up a table and getting started with playing what is one of the best rule sets for a sci-fi game available. If you're still looking to learn, there'll be an introductory game to watch in the next couple of weeks that will show all of these rules in action without interruption. If this has been helpful, subscribe to the channel or check out our website www.criticalhitwargaming.co.uk for more useful content and painting tutorials. Thanks for watching and happy wargaming.